and we enter into Texas's next phase of government. Basically, this is kind of equivalent to America's Gilded Age, uh, which was named after a book written by Mark Twain that talked about the shimmering outside that hid the uh, rusted iron underneath. And some interesting societal things are going on, and that's what we're going to be talking about. First thing is the problems of government. Uh, basically, at the Constitutional Convention of 1875, we were facing incredible problems. We had no money. Basically, they wanted to reorganize government and make it less, less powerful. Especially after they had to, uh, what many Texans felt, endure the uh, leadership of Edmund Davis. So they began to restrict and limit uh, a lot of the terms of senators and other such offices. So like senators went from six years down to four. Representatives went from four years down to just two. Governor's powers were limited severely. But one good thing about it was that they set apart uh, $3,256,970 uh, for education and land uh, out in East Texas, the proceeds of which were supposed to uh, support Texas education, but the government being the government, as you can guess, this land was in East Texas, which is where the nice, rich, lush land was. Politicians being politicians, they began to take away pieces of this land, move that land to less desirable land, till it found its way out near Midland and Odessa. And uh, does anybody know what happened out in Midland, Odessa, around 908, with San Marina number one? We struck oil. So that initial uh, endowment of uh, 350, uh, $3,256,970 bucks today is worth $11.4 billion because of that oil which is why the University of Texas at Austin actually has the third largest endowment for a university in the United States, uh, being beaten out only by Harvard and Yale. And that actually was through a uh, mistake rather than um, something done on purpose. Now, black suffrage during this period, and once again, this is right after Reconstruction. It ended in Texas in 1874 when the Democrats and Home Rule were able to take back positions. For the rest of the nation, it happened in 1876. But believe it or not, there is a lot of flexibility in uh, black voting, as long as there were no threat to the economics status. Indeed, we still had a state congressman sent. And one gentleman, uh, Norris Wright Cooney, who, or, yeah, who have, some have claimed as the uh, most powerful figure not only in Texas, but also in the South. He was very active in Galveston politics, becoming an alderman and a National Republican uh, delegate. He headed up the Union League. And by the 1890s, more than 100,000 blacks were voting in Texas. No doubt thanks to his efforts. He was born in 1846 near Hempstead, Texas, in the Brazos River Valley. Basically, he had a white father 
and a slave mother. But at the end of the war, he, uh, he left for a little while during the Civil War. At the end of the war, finds himself back in uh, Texas. And by the 1870s, he was appointed Sergeant in Arms of the Texas Legislature, where he befriended uh, Edmund Davis. He then headed up the uh, Galveston chapter of the Union League. Once again, that was an association, organization that was in support of uh, the North and um, was vital in getting many uh, of the newly freed men registered to vote. And because of his political as well as economic acumen, when he died in 1893, his net worth was approximately $150,000, which in today's money is worth about $4.27 million. So he was a very wise fellow. And like I said, he endeavored ceaselessly to make sure that uh, blacks got the right to vote. Now, how was black voting allowed? Well, it was allowed basically through special gerrymandered districts, where it was designed real awkwardly. And disenfranchisement or taking away the vote, even though it did occur, it was inconsistent. Indeed, 15 coastal counties here in Texas, uh, blacks were the majority. The color line was actually pretty casual. Indeed, in public areas, it was much more casual than it would later become in the 20th century. I mean, racially segregated areas did include like schools, churches, hotels, rooming houses, private social relations. But public places like trains, stations, theaters, and soda fountains were largely desegregated. Indeed, in 1885, a black journalist reported from Galveston that he had ridden on first-class cars on the railroad and was served in salons and soda fountains where he saw blacks dining with whites at the train station and he even saw a black police officer arrest a white man. Now, just 15 years later, this wouldn't happen. Well, what was the Rubicon moment that changed things? Well, the Rubicon moment happened with the rise of the Populist Party. This is in the late 1880s. And basically, the tenets of the, of the Populist Party, which tried to attract both black and white voters, uh, it became that the, uh, this third party, with the increase in the uh, black and white vote, was a threat to the Democratic Party. So, in order to limit or control the vote, Some Democratic leaders were able to convince others that blacks were retrogressing, poor as bestiality, 
especially the younger blacks now that never known slavery. Here you can see here's a political cartoon from Harper's Weekly where, you know, this guy's watching to make sure nobody else comes in. These two guys have pistols to the guy's head and it says, of course, he wants to vote the Democratic ticket. Because they had to control that vote. Because the black vote was the key vote that they could control. And we'll find out what happens next uh, in the 1890s uh, when America, I mean the South, really starts to retrogress themselves. Now what's funny is in the uh, convention, they not only did they talk about black voting and their way to restrict, to restrict that was through poll taxes which basically you had to pay a tax back in February if you wanted to vote. You had to keep a hold of that tax and receipt because elections are in when? Yeah, November. So you have to keep that tax throughout the whole year to be able to present. And of course, it also allowed you to disenfranchise poor whites if you wanted to. There were actually two resolutions in the Constitutional Convention of 1875 to uh, give women suffrage or allow females the right to vote. And even though it was brought up twice, no vote was ever taken. Now, why do a lot of people not realize that Texas was even in the Confederacy, much less than the Civil War? And this also has to do with why a lot of people don't like Texans. Started early on. Because of the great cattle drives. Now, the cattle drives here in Texas was nothing new to the West, especially in the South where it had been a common enterprise uh, just at the frontier of settlement. In Texas, this was especially true as cattle raising had been the only industry in Texas for many years under Spain as well as Mexico. I mean, since Jose Escandon began settling the southernmost part of Texas, establishing cities like Laredo, open range cattle was always the support. Indeed, Laredo was a town where basically people would keep their cows just out grazing in the fields. And after sundown, they'd cross over to the other side of the Rio Grande. With towns like Nuevo Laredo. So they'd have a little more defense from the Native Americans. Indeed, most of the items and words describing the American cowboy came from Spanish. Words like Mustang, Rodeo, Lariat, Chaps and spurs. It's even been said that a 10 gallon hat is a bastardization 
uh, the Spanish term. Maybe even the very saddle that the cowboys use is a Spanish saddle. Now, does anybody here know the difference between a Spanish saddle and an English saddle? The horn on the front? Yeah, the horn. You can tie a rope to. Now, cattle were so well adapted to Texas that they became more and more prolific. Escape cattle, as well as those on the range, slowly developed into longhorn cattle. A cattle that's lean, lanky. Well, then why do people like it? Because, guys, it was known for its speed and its endurance. It could last a long time without water. But the one problem that always befell the people in Texas was cattle really isn't worth that much. Because I've got cattle, you've got cattle, they've got cattle. Nobody really needs these cows. Well, that is until after the Civil War. Basically, uh, after the Civil War, the veterans returned to Texas to find there's as many as 5 million Longhorns roaming the Texas Plains. While the herds in the upper Mississippi and the north have been totally depleted by the war. So have we found our new money maker? You bet. Indeed, there, there was a guy by the name of Samuel Maverick who lived in San Antonio. And uh, he was always kind of showman. Anyway, uh, you have to brand your cattle here in Texas uh, for identification purposes. And because you have so many wild cattle running around, well, he did have an island where he kept his cattle on. Uh, and so the brand he registered was no brand. If it doesn't have a brand on it, it belongs to me. Trying to claim all of the cattle in Texas, the wild cattle, which of course didn't work. But it worked for the cattle that was on his island. And it also gave us the word maverick. Now, the first cattle drive began in 1866 when a large Texas herd set out for uh, Sogaya, Missouri. Why did it go out to Missouri? Well, because that's where the western terminus of the railroad was. Most specifically, the Missouri Pacific Railroad. And, of course, along the whole route, it was subject to raids by post-war bushwhackers and opposition by Arkansas, Missouri farmers whose cows would destroy their crops. But, basically, they were always pushing the cattle towards where the end of the railroads were. Well, then you have a Texan by the name of Joseph McCoy. He was one of three, he was the youngest of three brothers who helped turn Abilene, Kansas into a booming cow town with the help of part Cherokee uh, Jesse Chisholm and the Chisholm Trail. Now, have any of y'all ever been on the Chisholm Trail? Really? 
You know, a lot of 35, I 35 from Austin, up here, or San Antonio. Parts of it are based on the Chisholm Trail. And if you go out further west, I forgot, it's not 35 west. It's a farmer and market road off there. Got another part of the Chisholm Trail. Huge, huge trail. Anyway, uh, it, Abilene was changed from a small dead place consisting of about a dozen log huts in 1867 to a flourishing town by 1869. Indeed, the population of Kansas rose from 107,000 to 365,000. And by 1880, it was almost a million people. It had the same exact results for Nebraska. So the whole deal in this game is you would have cows taken from Texas all the way up to the railheads where they'd be sold. Now the whole way they're going up there, they might be losing a little weight, but the buyers who buy them buy these cows based upon how much they weigh. And the problem for these buyers is once you have them locked onto the cattle cars for the railroad, they're losing weight the whole way until they get to the slaughterhouse. So you're losing money. So a secret to higher profits would be to slaughter animals closer to the Midwest. And in 1869, G.H. Hammond, a Chicago meat packer, shipped the first refrigerated meat in an air-cooled car to Boston. Is everything okay? Okay. You know what's weird is, has anybody here ever gotten, anyway, that just reminded me, I got a weird text from, and I'm like, I have no idea who this is. And should I tell them back? That's a weird message. Anyway, eight years later, a guy by the name of Gustavo Swift, developed a more efficient mechanical refrigeration and it made him a fortune and produced an even further boost to the cattle industry because guys basically everything you see in the little meat market and part of the Safeway or Kroger or Walmart or whatever you get to you can thank Gustavo Swift for because uh, he was like, um, used uh, cheaper prices, clever marketing, pre-cut meat. Basically, he said, put the meat on display under glass, cut it into smaller slices, because the smaller you cut, the more you can sell. Because before this, everybody was used to buying, like they wanted to see the side of meat before they bought their beef. You know, you've seen that where you have the huge half of a cow carcass and you say, oh, I want, you know, the tenderloin or I want this. Now, why would they show the whole carcass? It's fresh. You gotta make sure it's fresh because guys, part of it could have been starting to go bad. And to prove that it was actually that part of the cow. Yeah. And if they weren't honest, guys, that's, you all know why barbecue was invented, right? And why it was invented in the South? Because meat goes bad quicker in the South. And they wanted a way to cook the meat that it would hide the fact that it was going bad, put a sauce on there, and we're all good. Anyway, needless to say, uh, basically his slaughterhouses that he owned 
and Chicago helped Chicago grow in importance and prominence? Now, do you know what's so funny? Do you know how long the Cowboys were? How long this whole Cowboy era lasted? You know, we got a team, we got a team called the Dallas Cowboys. So this was probably like a 75 year long thing, right? It was like 20, 28. Uh, it was 20 years. Only 20 years. But it's kind of been made into this majestic thing. Cowboys themselves were actually a very diverse group. You had more than 40,000 cowboys that roamed the Great Plains during the 20 years of the cattle drives. Most of these guys were young, with the average age being about 25 or 24, excuse me. Most of them were from very diverse backgrounds, like 30% of the cowboys were either African or Mexican American. The Cowboys themselves include Civil War vets from both sides. And you even had some Cowboys that came all the way from Europe to come over here and participate in the drives. Well, what happened to the cattle drives? Well, um, even though everybody likes to claim it was barbed wire. In 1873, Joseph Glidden, an Illinois farmer, had uh, developed barbed wire, giving farmers the ability to fence off their land to protect it from livestock as well as fencing off locations of water that cattle used to use. Now, of course, even though it was developed in 1873, it didn't really take off until there was a uh, fair down in San Antonio at the, um, near the military compound that was attended by John W. Bedamillion Gates, who was a salesman. And basically he bet a bunch of Texans $500 to anybody that had a bull that could break through his fencing. Because guys, have any of y'all ever seen um, regular fencing surrounding like livestock? Just regular steel, you don't. Why? because all animals have to do is just like lean against it or push hard enough and it's gone. So what does barbed wire make them do? Started it. Yeah, it hurts. No, it hurts them. So like, hey, forget that. I'll just get this grass over here. Unless nature, like a flood or something like that, washes out the fence post. And then all of a sudden, oh, okay, we can go over now. Well, guys, you know, they, you got all these Texas cowboys that he threw down that challenge to and they were like, I'm going to get that $500. They made the bulls angry as the way they make them at rodeos, which as a gentleman, you probably wouldn't like being done to you. But throw them in there, and of course, as soon as the bulls touched the wire, they backed off. Nobody was able to break through. He advertised his product as light as air, cheaper than whiskey, and stronger than dirt. And it sold like pancakes. And that's what a lot of people like to say, oh, and that was the death of the cattle drives. But it's not. What caused the cattle drives to die is basically the railroads finally got to where the cattle were. Oh, man. It's kind of boring. 
hindsight. But now let's get back to what's the problem for most of the people in uh, Texas. The farmers. And guys, ever since the Civil War, farmers have been continually frustrated by events outside of their control and the apparent lack of government to address any of their problems. Indeed, there was a huge decline in commodity prices. From 1870 to 1898, you have that long-term decline in crop prices. Now, what is this due to? Well, the first thing, why corn, why wheat, why cotton, is getting less money, is you have domestic overproduction. You have new technologies like the McCormick Reaper and the Iron Plow that made the harvesting of more crops possible. And this flood of goods on the market drives the prices down. Which, of course, if you're a farmer, it would seem that, hey, if I want to make more money, I better make more of this product. Which, instead of making the price, go, you know, stable as it off, actually makes it go down. So you're always caught behind an eight ball. And further complicating this, we have domestic overproduction of imported agriculture that's flooding out the markets. So while they still got to pay for their land, pay the rents, maybe start paying for stuff like fertilizer, trying to pay for stuff, uh, you're getting less and less money. You also have railroads and middlemen. Now for Texas, this is more freight rates and middlemen, because we didn't have at the beginning, even though the um, Constitution of 1878 and the, uh, government, uh, of the government of 1878 really worked out deals, to bring railroads to Texas. Basically, the railroads or the boatsmen or wagonsmen who were taking their crops charged the farmers high freight rates and the farmers would have to pay it as they really had no other way of getting their goods to market. The small farmers here in Texas couldn't get the big rebates like the Rockefellers and they didn't have the political influence in Austin or Washington, D.C. for that matter. And they have very little bargaining power as either buyers or sellers. I mean, when they sell their crops uh, to the buyers, they set the price. And of course, every other person is selling at that time. So you're getting the lowest possible price. And when you want to buy materials like the plows or the reapers, the sellers set the price. So you're getting it both ways. Meanwhile, you have high tariffs that were set by state and national politicians that actually work against the farmers. Now, wait a minute, how would a high tariff on foreign goods uh, hurt the farmer? Like, say there's high tariff, have y'all seen those little... Uh, um, kind of like tractors, like Kabucha or something like that. They sell like tractor supply company, a little kind of tractor thing. And that, that comes, I don't know, from somewhere over in Asia, probably Japan or someplace, or Korea even. 
But if there's a high tariff on that, that's going to make the John Deere te cheaper, right? Right? So isn't that going to help the farmer? Well, see, that's what you think, but think about it. You have, a, you have two products. You have the John Deere, which is 100 bucks. You have the kabucha, which is 98. So what the government does is they put a tariff on the kabucha, making it $120. And now the John Deere's only $10, right? I mean, $100, right? John Deere isn't stupid. What's John Deere going to do? 110. 110, 115. How much is this one? 120, 118. We're still cheaper. We're still cheaper. Hey, used to be $100. What are you doing? And then, not only that, but whatever country, Japan, who creates kombucha or South Korea or whoever, in return for, to hit us, they're going to basically raise their tariffs on our produce that's going over there. So they're going to be able to sell less of their crops to those foreign countries. So they're going to, those high tariffs are going to make the farmers pay more for their goods and get less for their crops. So as you can see, there's a seething frustration. Not only that, but after the Civil War, farmers saw themselves going deeper and deeper into debt. Farmers had to take out large mortgages to buy farm machinery and crop essentials. And in the South, some of the farmers had to sign up for crop liens, basically become a sharecropper for the money. Well, once you're indebted into somebody, they can tell you exactly what crop you're going to have to grow. And of course down here in Texas, it's going to be King Cotton. And if everybody's growing cotton, the value for it is going to go down. Now you are able, once again, through sharecropping, you were able to make the crops, and you might get a lot of money at the end, but guys, the person who owned the land might have worked out a deal taking as much as 70% of the crop. So you find yourself right back into the hole. And guys, this is also a message for everybody about credit cards, and why use them, because they're nothing but a tool, but be smart. Because, of course, if you have to do sharecropping, you're not going to have the money for cotton seed or anything like that. Well, the guy who you did his land, he would let you buy stuff like cotton seed on credit. So if you bought a bag of cotton seed, if you had had the money, it would have cost you 10 cents. But the guy says, no, I'm going to give it to you on credit. So by the end of harvest, because you hadn't paid that money back and you were going to, say, take it out of the crop, the interest he charged you would make that bag of cotton that would have been 10 cents, now it's 22 cents. And not only that, but we had what is called an inadequate currency. Basically, America everywhere, industrially, agriculture, and Texas, we were growing so quick that we couldn't really keep up with our growth currency-wise. Indeed, the per capita currency in circulation decreased 10% from 1865 to 1890. Basically from $30 uh, to 27 per capita. Which caused a lot of people to say, hey, you need to print out more silver. Especially as they just had some silver fines, some huge silver fines here in America. Which would have put more money into circulation. And uh, Congress in 73, Congress passed a revision of uh, the coinage laws 
dropping for the provision of the coinage of silver, which reduced, of course, its value. So basically, you had a lot of people ticked off. And that's when Oliver H. Kelly enters the scene. Basically, this guy was a government clerk. And in 1867, he goes around looking at the countryside. And he notices, how many of y'all have driven, even though it is getting, because this area is growing up so much, 35. How many of you driven from Dallas down to San Antonio? And you have, once you get out of the city, what do you see? Fields. Fields, fields. House. Field, field, house, field, 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 house. Guys, farmers are totally separated from each other. He noticed the isolation of farmers. And he wanted to do something about it. So he founded the Patrons of Husbandry, which was better known as the Grange, which is an old English word for grain. And as you can guess, the membership exploded. They would, there's an example of a Grange Hall right there. And by the way, have any of y'all ever been to the Petite Strawberry Festival? Have y'all ever heard of it? Little town near San Antonio and all that. Basically, it's hosted by the uh, Grange of Petite. The Grange Hall. Anyway, membership to this group exploded as high as 1.5 million by 1874. And even though it, became, it began as a social educational club, like, hey, we're going to hold dances, have everybody get together. Hey, we're going to teach people a better way to grow crops. Hey, we're going to teach, you know, things. Well, guys, if you have a movement that has a lot of people that are facing the same problems, they're gonna get together and it should know, become as no surprise that they start to talk about solutions that they feel are really harming them. So soon it becomes a movement for farmer-owned cooperatives. Now what's a cooperative? What's a co-op? Anybody here know? Let's say y'all are farmers. And let's say y'all have 200 bucks. That's your worth. I mean, you've got more than your worth, but what you can pay in cash, 200 bucks. If you had a grain silo, you could store your crops so when that buyer was coming for your crops and he'd say, I'll only give you 10 cents a bushel, you could say, up yours and preserve a part of your crops because you know that price is going to go up after everybody else has sold theirs. Only problem is a silo is going to cost you a thousand bucks. All you got is two hundred. Well, if you all get together and say, hey, it's going to cost you this much to join our co-op, then together, y'all can buy a silo. Together, y'all can buy a tractor. Now, if you all as a group buy a tractor, you get to use it during these two weeks you get to use it during these two weeks. You get to use it during this week and only three days because we're kind of, you, you're just going to get a week, but you don't have as much land. But they try to make it as equitable as possible to give y'all access to what the big boys have. Then, of course, they start talking about politics and they organize into a political party known as the uh, Grangers. What were the goals of the Grange? Basically, it's a third party. They wanted the regulation of railroad and warehouse rates. And in five states, and in Texas, Texas was weird. Because Texas, the Democratic Party would always do this to the third parties. Is the Democratic Party would absorb whatever the uh, constituents want. Because once again, if you absorb them, 
then the Democrats can stay in power and we're not going to have to worry about the Republicans. Some of these Granger laws were able to be passed, and even though they were basically ineffective, they laid the foundation for stronger laws regulating railroads and warehouses. <coughs> Which the Supreme Court actually upheld warehouse regulation in the case of Munn v. Illinois, where the Supreme Court ruled that states hold police powers to regulate property in the interest of public good. So everything seems like it's going great for its brief little time, but then you start to have the fall of the Granger with a failure of their economic ventures because many of the uh, uh, cooperative uh, movements that they started failed. The businesses they tried to get started failed. Why do you think they failed? Why do you think these farmers may not have been good at business? Or I'll ask you another question. Do y'all think businessmen would be really great at farming? Different skill set. Yeah, different skill set. They just don't know how to do it. They're not trained. They're not educated in that. Okay? And by the way, even if you're a businessman, your chances of failure are very high. Okay? So anyway, a lot of their economic ventures fail. A lot of the people start to leave. This coincides with the rise of another party, which was very big in Texas for its boom years, which were only about four. Basically, they're a national party, but very big here in the state of Texas. What did they want? They wanted the printing of more greenbacks, or they wanted more money to be in circulation. By 1878, midterm elections, they received more than a million votes, and 15 congressmen were elected. But just two years later, in 1880, the party is starting to decline, and by 1884, the party's just totally dissolved. Well, probably in Friday's lecture, we'll talk about a group that actually made it huge that started here in Texas. The southern part did. A year later, the northern part did. The two sides got together and tried to change the world, and maybe for a little bit they did. Right, right?